stocks are getting slammed and more than one in five investors are closing their accounts according to a survey by Ally Financial. So why are you thinking of investing in the middle of a recession? Because you're smart, that's why. You know that right now is the best time to invest. You know that all those investors running for the exits are selling at exactly the wrong time, selling low and buying high after last year's market frenzy. You know that you are now getting stocks at a discount and you're ready to get started. I love it and I'll be right there with you to show you how to start investing, why investing in a recession is the best decision you'll ever make, and how to do it right. I'm also going to take you back, way back, to the last five recessions to show you how much you would have right now if you invested during the recession. I'm going to give you a step-by-step -step to start investing, but since we're talking about investing in a recession, let's look at what that actually means and how investing in a recession is different. And let's get started by going back to that first big recession, fire up the DeLorean with 1.2 gigawatts and head back to 1987. It's the era of Reaganomics, Ghostbusters before it sucked, and uh, yuppies. It was also a five-year bull market from 1982 that crashed 30% in just three months. Now, a bull market is anytime stock prices are rising off recent lows for a few months or more. Now, this chart by McKinsey shows the history of bull and bear markets back to 1956 with the bull markets on top. You see here that over the last 12 bull markets, stocks have gone up an average of 129%, and it's lasted for about 54 months from that low price in the bear market. So tell yourself that two-ton bull charging at you and ready to trample? That's a good thing. A bear market then is when stocks are falling. Uh, technically, it's when stocks are down at least 20% from the recent high, but you're going to hear people say it's a bear market after every little hiccup in prices. On average, though, bear markets have lasted nine months and have seen stocks drop by 28% from that peak in stocks. And we mostly see bear markets or those falling stock prices before a recession. That's when that economic activity like consumer spending, manufacturing, and trade falls for more than six months. And the bear mauled the markets hard. Black Monday, October 19th of 1987, when the market fell 22% on one day alone. And in all that chaos, you could have picked up shares of the Walt Disney Company, ticker DIS, for just $2.95 on a split adjusted basis. Investing $1,000 in Disney at just $3 a share in the recession, do you know how rich you would be right now? It's kind of hard to believe, but stick around to the end when we've traveled back through those each of those five recessions and I'll reveal how much investing in each recession is really worth. But back to the present. And now investors will make up all kinds of reasons and excuses for why stocks are falling, but the very core of it, the truth is that stocks are an ownership of a company's earnings. When you own a stock, you own a share of the company's future profits. Well, those profits fall in a recession. This chart by Deloitte shows the change in corporate profits back to 1948, with the recession shaded, and the effect is obvious. That drop in the economy means about a 10% drop in earnings. So the next time someone tries to make up some smart-sounding reason why stocks are falling in a bear market, just tell them, Nah, it's the economy, stupid. Okay, maybe word it a little nicer than that. So as the economy starts to slow down, as investors get spooked that we might be heading into a recession, they sell stocks, and that's why stock markets fall before a recession. Now that's the background here, and with that, you're already smarter than 90% of the investors out there, so yay you. Now, before you start investing, though, you do need to understand that investing during a recession is, is different than when you're investing in a bull market that's taking stocks higher. First is that different stocks tend to do better during a recession or a bear market versus the ones that do best in a bull market. Now, this chart by Fidelity shows the 11 stock sectors, groups of companies that serve a similar product and, and how each did during the recessions back to 1962. Here you see those traditional safety sectors on the left. Stocks in the sectors like consumer staples, utilities, and healthcare tend to do better during a recession because people need to buy those things even when the economy is falling. On the other hand, stocks in the sectors like communication services, which is a lot of your internet stocks, uh, information technology, and real estate tend to fall hardest in a recession. So if you're just starting out investing in a recession and you're worried about stocks falling more, then maybe buy some of these safety sectors, stocks in the consumer staples, utilities, and healthcare companies. But put on your red puff vest because it's time to go back to another recession, this time back to 1990 and the smell of teen spirit. The recession here was caused by a combination of high oil prices, a pullback in defense spending, and the savings and loan crisis. But what do you do in a recession? You invest, and in 1990, you could have laced up shares of Nike for just 66 cents each. Invest $1,000 in Nike after the crash, and you wouldn't quite have enough to buy the shattered backboard Jordans for $615,000, but you'll be surprised at how much you'd have. Outside of stocks, one of the best investments you can make right now is in the Series I savings bonds. It's a guaranteed 9.6% return, protection from inflation, and a stock market crash. 
I recently did a video describing these and how to invest in them. So look for that link to that video in the description below. Eventually though, you're gonna wanna shift to buying stocks in the sectors that rebound the fastest in a bull market. This chart shows the sector performance just as the economy is starting to pick back up after a recession. Here you see stocks and sectors like consumer discretionary, industrials, and technology tend to do the best. So if you're investing during a recession and you're willing to take a little pain, buying into these stocks early is going to mean you get a front row seat to the best stocks when the market starts heading higher. Most importantly though, investing during a recession, you're not going to get that kind of instant gratification that you get investing during the bull market. People love investing in bull markets because they get to see their stocks rise immediately, watching the value of the portfolio grow every day. You are just not going to get that investing during a recession. Uh, in fact, you might even see your stocks fall as you invest each month. It's going to be a serious test to your courage, but be strong. Keep investing. Over time, your investments made in those market lows going to be worth much more than the investor buying stocks in the bull market. And no matter what stocks you buy, investing in a recession is tough, but will make you money. I see Doc Brown waving off camera. It's time to go back, back to the Asian financial crisis and the currency collapse of 1998. Now this one wasn't named an official recession, but after a 272% bull market over an extremely long eight years, stocks crashed 20% in just two months. So yeah, it felt like a recession. We're in the middle of the dot-com bubble, and what better stock to buy than shares of Apple, ticker AAPL. Steve Jobs had just returned from a 12-year absence, and you could have picked up the stock for just 26 cents each in 1998 for what could be the biggest return on our list. Now that we've talked about how investing in a recession is different, I want to share with you a simple process to start investing. Everything from getting ready to invest to when to buy and sell stocks but I also want to personally invite you to get the weekly bow tie, our free weekly newsletter with all the stock market news, strategies, and trends you need to know. Each week before the market opens, I'll show you what I'm watching and the stocks that could highlight the week. It's all totally free, just something I like to do for all you out there in the community, so look for that sign-up link below. Back to getting you investing though, and starting with the single most important part of this video, of your journey investing, and that's getting your personal finances ready to invest. Not what you were expecting, was it? I know, it's not as sexy as stock picking or talking about that next 10x idea, but this right here, getting ready to invest, is what will determine your success investing, and it's something most investors neglect completely. What I'm talking about here is getting your finances ready for you to start investing because it's one of the most heartbreaking things to see, and it happens all the time, but, but I see people start investing. They're motivated and their portfolio is growing, then something happens that they have to withdraw that money. Nation, it is so demotivating having to start back at zero, and a lot of people just give up. They never get back to investing in, and it ruins their lives. So just a few recommendations here to get your finances ready to invest. First is you need at least a month's worth of expenses tucked away in savings. Now I know a lot of people are going to tell you you need three to six months of expenses, and I'd say three months is a good target, but I don't want you saving forever before you start investing. The important point here is you have some of that what-if money in savings, so you never have to withdraw from your investments. Next, if you can't scratch together at least $150 to invest each month, it's time to take a cold, hard look at your budget and your income. Now that's something most people don't think about, that income side of the equation. Yeah, most people can usually find an extra 50 or so in the budget to invest, but sometimes you just got to realize you need to make more money. Now, we've got a lot of great videos on the channel for building that passive income and starting a side hustle. I'll link to a few of those in the video description, so check those out. But now as you're planning all this, I also don't want you investing every single dime, sacrificing everything and, and being miserable. I fell into that trap in my 20s. I was saving every penny, working two jobs and, and managing my own rentals. I was living on ramen noodles and having zero fun, ju just so I could invest a little bit more. The problem here is I would burn out every six months or so and go on a shopping spree. I'd set myself back two steps and it was because I didn't have a plan for what I could realistically invest in and still be happy. So take a look at your budget, set an amount to invest that can get you to your goals but still leave some room for enjoying life. Now you're ready to start investing but maybe you have no idea what that looks like, especially how much should you invest. The best answer and the worst here is just invest what you can. I know it's not the easy answer you wanted but it is the truth. I'll show you how to plan your finances around investing next, but there is no set rule for how much to invest. Yeah, you're going to hear all kinds of things like invest 10% of your income or calculators telling you how much you need to invest, but these are all leaving out one crucial detail. That's you. Your own income and budget is going to determine how much to invest each and every month. So just figure out what's left in your budget after paying those must-pay expenses. I would recommend start with investing at least $100 or $150 a month, but 
If you can't do that, start with $50 a month. The clock on the DeLorean says it's the year 2000. I'm a young corporal in the Marines, and the world is realizing the scariest thing about Y2K was the bad movies. Seriously, Travolta, what were you thinking? The Fed is raising rates and popping that dot-com bubble, sending shares of Amazon down to just 67 cents by 2002, and down 95% from its 1999 peak. This one stock alone could have made you a millionaire. Back to how to invest in a recession, though, and what's important here, and what I probably should have led with is, is that you just get started investing. You start building that habit of putting money in stocks no matter how much, whether it's $250 a month or 25 bucks. Because once you build that habit, then you can worry about all these other questions like whether you're investing enough to meet your goals, but I want you to get into that habit first. Now you're ready to start investing, but what do you invest in? You've got the money, what do you put it in for a maximum return? And first off, I'm gonna reveal the biggest lie in investing, that it's all about picking stocks. In fact, investing is much more about that regular amount you invest and watching it grow over 10 or 20 years. So don't stress out so much about picking that right stock because the best strategy for your investment dollars, and this is the one I use with my own portfolio, is called the core satellite approach. Now that strategy is called the core satellite because you have that core of investments that make up between 60 and 75% of your portfolio. These are in exchange traded funds or ETFs. For example, you might have 15% of your money in the Vanguard Real Estate Fund, that's ticker V&Q, which holds shares of companies in that real estate sector. Maybe you hold another 10% of your money in the Vanguard Long-Term Bond ETF, ticker BLV, which invests in hundreds of bonds and pays a 3.3% dividend. Finally, maybe you hold another 50% of your portfolio in a few funds like the ProShares S&P 500 Dividends Aristocrats ETF, a ticker NOBL, a fund of the best dividend stocks in the market. So then by investing most of your money, that core 60 or 75% in three to five funds, you get an instant diversification across stocks, bonds, and real estate. Your money is spread out across hundreds of stocks. You've got bonds in that bond fund and cash flow from the real estate fund. Now for that core part of your portfolio, you'll also want to invest in index funds like the ones I highlighted in our Just One Stock series. Check out the video linked in the description for the one index fund I think every investor needs to own. Then here with that satellite portion of your portfolio, the remaining 25% or so of your money, you invest in individual companies that you really think could produce those higher returns. Now, the beauty of this core satellite strategy is that because you only have about 25% of your money invested in these individual stocks, and say you only invest maybe 3 to 5% of your money in each stock, that means you're only picking maybe eight or 10 individual stocks. So instead of having to find 20 or 30 stocks, doing hours of analysis on each one, keeping up to date on each one every quarter, you only need a handful of winners. This strategy is gonna cut in half the amount of time you spend looking for stocks to buy and following your investments. You don't have to worry about those three to five funds you hold. They're diversified across a group of stocks, bonds, or real estate, and so they're gonna get that average return on the investment. Okay, you have an idea of the stocks you wanna buy, but now where? Which is the best online platform for beginner investors? Nation, there are a million and one investing platforms, but honestly, they're all pretty much the same. There are three things that you wanna look for here, and then I'm gonna share which platforms I use. First, you wanna look for an investing site that does not charge you to buy stocks. And when I started investing in 1999, Brown & Company disrupted the industry by being one of the first low-cost brokers at just $5 a trade, but even that's too much anymore. Most of the major brokerages and investing apps have gone commission-free. Now, it's also nice to use a site that lets you invest in fractional shares. That means you can invest any amount of money in any stock, no matter what the stock price is. You can invest in $50 in shares of Amazon instead of having to buy a full share at $100 plus. The site's just gonna split that share up and you're gonna get $50 worth. Third here is you wanna look for a platform that gives you the investing tools and the research you need to invest. Now, this one isn't nearly as important as the other two and some investors, especially beginners, might not even need any research tools. Now, the trick though, when you're picking where to invest is there's nothing wrong with having more than one investing account. In fact, between retirement accounts, uh, regular accounts, I have nine accounts on six different investing apps. I use E-Trade and Merrill Lynch for research, a Weeble and M1 Finance for investing because of that commission-free trading, and, and I also have accounts on Ally and Fundrise. It's free to open an account, and a lot of times you're gonna get bonuses like free shares or cash when you deposit, like with Weeble if you use the link I'll leave in the video description below. We're down to actually investing your money, how to buy a stock, and this is gonna be the easy part. I'll show you how to buy a stock on E-Trade here, but the process is almost identical on most apps. 
we're here in one of my accounts and let's say I want to buy shares of everyone's favorite Tesla. Now, if you don't know the abbreviated ticker symbol, you can always just type in the company name and the dropdown is going to show you that ticker. Here on the stocks profile page, you see all the basics like price, market cap, the 52 week range of prices. And then across the top here, you can see a bigger chart, recent news, and then options trading. Let's say I've already done all my research and want to buy the shares. So I click buy over here. This order page is almost identical on any platform. You see the bid price of the shares, which is the highest price an investor in the market is offering to buy. And here the ask price is the lowest an investor is willing to sell the shares in the market right now. Now these two prices get more important if you're options trading because they can be much further apart. For most stocks though, this bid and the ask price is gonna be less than a few pennies difference and right around the quoted price for the shares. In this action dropdown, you can buy, sell, sell short, or buy to cover a stock. We'll select buy and then put in how many shares we want. Now, if you're on a platform that lets you buy fractional shares, this is probably gonna be a dollar amount, how much you want to invest rather than having to pick the number of shares. For this price type, the majority of the time when you're buying stocks, you can just put in a market order. That's gonna buy the shares immediately at the current market price. These other orders, like the limit order, are more for when there's a large bid ask spread and you need to tell the app what price you want the shares. Again though, not really an issue for most stocks. The platform is automatically gonna show me the total cost of the trade and I'm ready to go. We've got just enough plutonium to charge the flux capacitor for one last trip. Back to the big one, the 2008 financial crisis. This one is still painful for a lot of us investors, but with that time machine, you could go back and pick up shares of Bank of America, ticker BAC for just $2.60 each at that March 2009 bottom. We've got two more questions to answer for investing in a recession. Then I'll reveal how much you'd have in these five recession investments right now. First though, you know I've got to send that special shout out to all you out there in the Bowtie Nation. Thank you for spending a part of your day here. If you're not part of that community yet, just click that little red subscribe button. It's free and you'll never miss an episode. So let's say you started buying stocks. Hell, you get 10 new ideas a day from CNBC or online, but a question most investors never ask, how many stocks should you own? Because you get all these great investing ideas every day online or, or on TV and it can be easy to build a portfolio of hundreds of stocks. You just keep investing in everything you hear about, but you really don't need to. Research shows that once you get maybe 20 or 30 stocks, your overall return in stocks looks a lot like the average market return because you're just so diversified. You've got a little of everything. It's another reason why I love that core satellite strategy. Having those three to five funds gives you all the diversification you need in those asset classes. And then you just pick 10 or 15 stocks of companies that you really like, stocks you think can do really well over the next 10 or 20 years. The strategy spreads your risk around with those funds. Uh, those are gonna get you that market return, but since you've got a little more in that small handful of stocks, you get the opportunity for those higher returns just 10 or 15 stocks for that upside shot if a few of them really take off. You've got those stocks, you're investing every month. When do you take your profits and run? When do you sell a stock? Of course, the simple answer would be never. Just hold on to those three funds and the 10 to 15 stocks you really like, maybe even 20 stocks until you retire and start living off your investments. But we all know it's not as easy as that. Even long-term investors don't hold their stocks that long. Sometimes you need to sell it and you better know when that time comes. Now I did a full video on this that I'll link to in the description below, but really it comes down to three problems that I like to watch for in my stocks. First is if there's a scandal or a lawsuit and then no accountability by management. Hey, bad things happen to good companies and even the best run into problems sometimes, but if management doesn't step up and say, hey, this was my fault, here's what I'm doing to fix it, then I'm dumping the shares. Another problem I watch for is the company piling on too much debt. I've just seen this become a problem too often in the past. Companies go into that acquisition spree, buying up everything they can, and they fund it with mountains of debt. Of course, those acquisitions never go as planned, and the debt payments just become unsustainable. The dividend is cut, and the share price plummets, so you want to be out before that happens. The third signal here is if the stock price just reaches where I think it should be. And whenever you're investing, you need some kind of an estimate, whether it's from analyst targets or your own, how much is that stock worth? And here, I wouldn't necessarily sell a stock as soon as it reaches that target, but if it goes much higher, I'm looking for something with a little bit more room for a return. Here we are. We're heading into another recession, but you don't care because you've invested through those five previous crashes. You've invested $1,000 in each of our recession stocks, and now you're sitting on a Scrooge McDuck pile of stocks worth $879,686. You would have more than 10 x your investment on every one of these, even on that 2008 recession just 14 years ago. On those shares of Apple in 1998, 
you've made more than 534 times your money. Imagine that, turning just $5,000 into almost 1 million because you had the courage to invest through a recession. Click on the video to the right for the one index fund every investor needs to buy, that one fund that needs to be in your portfolio. Don't forget to join the Let's Talk Money community by tapping that subscribe button and clicking the bell notification.